Malcolm Dennis. Very good morning. Uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Kwan and the leadership for this invitation again to share something from the Word of God with us. Uh, this morning, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I was very blessed by all your testimonies, your sharing. You know, this this is the kind of service that I really really like to see and to to be in. You know, most churches nowadays there's no time for testimony. So you don't know what God is doing in the church. You know what I mean? Only the pastor or the song leader or the chairman will be sharing all, but we don't hear anything from the floor, you know. So it's really, really good. The little things are uh, to give glory to God for all these little, little things that seem smaller and insignificant is really, really important, you know, to, to, to praise God and acknowledge that He is also in the small things. He is not just with the businessmen with the big plans or the big building plans of the church. He is in every little thing, every tiny area of our life, you see. And that's really, really powerful, I feel, to give God the glory uh, from the top to the bottom. Hallelujah. Man. Even the ground, uh, the tiniest space uh, can give glory to Jesus. You know, nobody got time to look for all these things. They won't even print this kind of testimony in the big church, you know. But praise God, you know, that here we can give glory to God for everything. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. You know, and this uh, simplicity uh, is very, very vital in our faith and in our uh, desire to follow, to follow God. Uh, can I have just one more stand here, please? Yeah, today I'll be sharing from Psalms chapter 92. We will start there and then we will go to Mark chapter 10. Yeah. Psalms chapter 92, <clears throat> we will start here, in verse um, 12 to 15. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. And you know that these palm trees and the cedar trees, they are very straight. They are very strong and the timber is used for building the temple and, and, and those structures that need reliable, reliable, reliable uh, material. You see. So in the light of these palm trees, flourishing like a palm trees or, and the cedar trees of Lebanon, which are very, very well known, they are like the teak wood in Thailand, you can say. So those who are planted in the house of the Lord. So this word planted continues with verse 12 concerning this agricultural metaphor. This agricultural metaphor of trees flourishing and the uh, cedar of Lebanon. So the psalmist continues with the verse, uh, this metaphorical, uh, this agricultural metaphor with the word planted, those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. If you want to flourish, if you want to flourish, you have to be planted. We cannot be floating. We cannot be hopping from church to church. We cannot take lightly where our relationship with Jesus is. It has got to have roots. All right? It has to be planted. Then as a result of this, planted, this planting, 
they shall still bear fruit in old age. So powerful. You shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. Lord, we thank you for your presence here with us today. We thank you for your word for this church. We ask that your spirit will continue to enlighten every heart and mind as we hear your word, Lord. We pray that we will hear only your voice and the voice of the spirit. In Jesus' mighty name. There are many Christians today who desire to be, um, who desire to grow in their Christian life, and many of us want to experience God. Is it now? God wants us to experience Him uh, in the little areas, the little things that um, some of us have shared. He wants us to experience Him in the external parts of our life. Yes, this is very important. He wants us to experience His provision helping us in our job, our career path, our studies. He wants us to experience Him in our relationships, in our journey in life, and the little things that people have mentioned here today, yes. But much, much more than that, He wants us to experience Him in our heart. He wants us to experience His grace in a transforming way that transforms the heart. Not just put money in our bank account, but transform our heart because the purpose of Jesus dying on the cross and saving us and coming into our hearts is so that God will, will begin this process of changing us from glory to glory to glory, from strength to strength to strength, and from to change us Another way that Paul puts it is to be conformed in Romans chapter 8, to be conformed to the image of his son, to the likeness of God. Is it? Because when, we, when Adam and Eve were created in the image of God in the beginning, when they fell into sin, that image of God in us has become marred. The image is still there. There is still some inclination towards God, towards finding who is this creator, uh, what, who am I, what am I here for? There is that inclination because there's something inside us that came from God into us. You see. Genesis uh, 1 to 3 tells us that God breathed into us. Now you don't find an animal sit sitting in the church looking for God because they are not created in the image of God. They don't have that that God didn't breathe in that same way His likeness into animals. Or else we will see dogs, cats, horses, lions, camels inside the church next to us, you see? Because they will be looking for their Creator also. But only human beings are created in the image of God. So there's something inside us that yearns to know what lies beyond the grave. What lies beyond this life? Is it all there is to it? The physical, material, is life so morbid, so stereotyped, one-dimensional, horizontal, and that's it? Make money, enjoy our wine and steaks? Is that all there is to it? No, there's much, much more to it because you are deeper than a good steak. Even a New York steak. You are deeper than that. You are deeper than the best crab meal uh, in Saramban. You are deeper than the seafood. You, see. you are deeper than Musang King. There's something deeper inside you. Even Musang King cannot touch. Hak Chi, Black Thorn also cannot touch. And so, we all have this deep yearning for God. You see. All right? We have this deep yearning for God. Now, but the problem is, we all have this similar yearning for God, but not all are willing to pursue God to meet this, to fill this yearning. Not many are willing to give up their life to pursue Jesus and allow Him to have full control over our life, to guide us, 
to lead us to be everything to us every day of our life. Even people who have gone full time may not want to live in a in pursuing God in this way. You see. It's just like we want to eat Musang King, you know. Some people want to eat Musang King and Black Thorn, but they are only willing to take out five dollars. They want to eat the Musang King when they walk past, they see, wow, it's so creamy. Then the seed is so small. Just looking on here, make your stomach turn already. You start to salivate, you know. Just by looking on here, you know, they open it up uh, so nicely. Uh, I tell you, you can ping sun, uh, you can faint, you know. I only tasted it once last month. Uh. Once in my life, and it's so memorable. And so, so we are willing to give ourselves fully to pursue a good education, to make money, to get a job, to, to develop our skill, or to upskill ourselves after we have got a skill. We are willing to pursue many, many things uh, until we succeed and until we get the contract, until we get the girl or the boy that we want to marry. And we are willing to pay any price to get what we want on this horizontal, material, physical life, you see. But when it comes to the eternal things of God and His life and the life of His Spirit and to experience God's transforming power inside us and the reality of Jesus working inside us deeply, you know, changing us from what, what we were last year in to a better person within us, into a more human and humane person. Salvation is, by the way, God rehumanizing us. Salvation in Jesus is not God making us superhuman, but making us human. That's why Jesus was not only fully God when in his incarnation, he was fully human. To show us what it means to become a full human being. What it means to be human. Confucius taught the Chinese people in China to be yako houyan, yako haoren. But there's no example, there's no perfect example, is it? But in Jesus, we see the perfect, sinless human being. Is it? What is it like? The human, to be human means to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your will, and all of your whole life, and to love your neighbor as yourself. To live a self-giving life, which is the most, the best way to live a fully enriching life, because as you live that way, the Spirit of God and the life of the Spirit will enrich you and deepen you to become more Human. How, how can we practice human rights when we are not fully human? How can we be humane if we are not human? So all the fruits of the Spirit is to make us human. What it means to be human, you look at Jesus. You look at the life of Paul. Is to be human. To be human can also involve or include God's anointing. God's power is it, to heal the sick. God's compassion to help the poor, like you just mentioned. Is it. God's grace and His fullness. Is it. So to become human. Is it. So we can spend hours in front of a TV, in social media, in shopping with friends, and looking for a nice shoe, a nice handbag, a nice whatever it is, looking for good deals. We can spend a long time even on Shopee and Lazada. You know. But Jesus... Jesus, poor Jesus. Jesus only gets the leftovers. You know, so some people have this attitude. I uh, no need to be so serious. La. Just believe in Him only enough. La. Once a week, go to church and worship Him, do some charity work, help the poor a little bit. Be a good person, enough. La. Believism uh, will not change us. Is it? 
Many Christians believe, but they don't follow Jesus. They believe and they stop there, is it? And then they do the bare minimum, is it? If we are a $5 Christian, as I mentioned just now, if we are that kind of a $5 Christian, then it's okay. We can aim for the bare minimum and be a spiritual minimalist. Aim for the cheapest in the Christian life, aim for the lowest, and aim for the easiest path. And take the path of least resistance. And our goal will be to be changed into our own likeness. To have life to be made in our image. The kind of life that we want to see. So today's Christian is, the question today is, do we want to be just a $5 Christian? Do we want to be easily satisfied where we are, right we, where we are right now? Or do we want to grow from glory to glory and strength to strength? Many, even during Jesus' time, said they want to follow him. And many followed him. But many also turned back from following him. Many followed him only in name. Also, is it? So we need to take heart and be careful. To see. So what does it mean to be planted? To be planted in the house of the Lord means uh, that thing that has been planted in God. Now today's metaphor is this. You must imagine that uh, and know that God speaks to us a lot through metaphors. I'm the vine, you are the branches. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. So God speaks to us through metaphorically in many, many ways. Is it? Now, secondly, this word plant implies that God is the ground. If God is the ground of life, ground of our life, we feel very safe. Because this ground cannot be corrupted. This ground is utterly reliable, dependable. It's the most stable person in this entire universe that we can depend upon uh, for uh, our existence and our destiny. To be planted means... The thing that has been planted must have roots and it becomes more and more rooted in the ground, into the ground. This planting has got two dimensions to it. To be planted into God, which we will talk about, and to be planted in the community that is the church. You see. So we don't exist for our own selves. We exist in community with others. We, no man is an island. No woman is an island. God never made, made us to exist as to live an individualistic life. Just concern for I, me, and myself. Chiki ku chiki. Alright, that is not in the plan of God at all, is it? So the community that we live in, and we need to seek God to find out where he wants us to be, which church he wants us to belong, and that is our community, you see. Of course, when a lot of people will complain, they say, oh, yeah, you know the church, these Christians are full of hypocrites. Yes, we are also one of them. Because we can't even live up to our own standards. You know, let alone expect others to, you see. Yes, it's true. We have to learn to fit in. Uh. If not, find a place where God is calling you to and fit in there. Plug in there. If others don't know how to be a community or a good person, then you show them the way. You show them by your good example. And the next thing about planted, being planted is don't be distracted. <laughs> Everybody was distracted there. Okay, don't be distracted. Yeah, sometimes the trees can go a bit slanted. On. So, Yeah, so the roots, so if to be planted, planted into God means having, cultivating a relationship with Jesus. To be planted into God means cultivating a relationship with Jesus. To be planted in a community means developing relationships with people in the church around us, you see. So to be planted, you see. So God doesn't want us to be hoppers, of floaters, of floaters, you see. Those 
kind of Christian life is not in the plan and purposes of God. A person cannot grow and be changed if you just live alone. So if the roots of the plant are shallow, if our relationship with God is shallow, if our relationship with Jesus is like the touch and go type, you know, if our relationship with Jesus is like, a, like one ham chim peng and half cup of black coffee, kao tim. You know, when I grew up, you know, I came from a Chinese family. Eh? I grew up in a Chinese family. My mother's side, they're all Chinese. They're all hardcore mahjong players. Our house, uh, we collect numbers on, you know. One number, two number, two, two, two digit, three digit, four digit. Because my auntie, they, they are very poor. I grew up with my mother's uh, sisters, you see. So they collect numbers, ji fa po, you know, the red color one. You know. uh, so our house was like that. You know. So my auntie would get commission when they sell every dollar. You see. So when we were young growing up in that house, we not only learned to play mahjong and count, we also, I learned two Chinese characters very early in life, tai tong sai. Big and small. Because when people phone the house, they will say, I want to buy this number, 1003, $2 big and $2 small. So you must write correctly, you see. So we learn Chinese character by looking at the mahjong and learning how to take these numbers. You see? So that was my, my childhood. La. So, so if we are planted in our relationship with Jesus in a very shallow way, then our breakfast, uh, our spiritual life and walk with God is like half a ham chim peng and half a cup of black coffee, that's all. Pin do kao. Look at you all so healthy and big size. You got to have something solid. When you, if you are a young Christian, you can live by every day with Jesus. You see. But if you have been two, three years old Christian, you cannot go by just every day with Jesus. We will talk about it as we go on. So if the roots, if our relationship with Jesus is very shallow, touch and go, we don't, we don't seek Him every day, we don't take Him that seriously, then our plant, our plant, the roots of the plant will become very shallow. See? may become two inches deep only. You don't want to be a plant that has roots uh, just two inches deep or four inches deep. See? We want to be a plant that has got roots that goes deep down and is continuously growing deeper and deeper and deeper. Why? You know? This ground is not only God, but below this ground, there is a stream of living waters, you know, and that is Jesus. There is a river in this ground. You, see. you can read that in Psalms 46. You see. There is a river that flows in the house of God. You see. So we, our roots have to be going, growing deeper and deeper into the ground. You see. And what are these roots like? It's our, we must want to want Jesus. We must one to one God. You, see. you must one to one God. You see. So it's nothing to do with feelings. You just make the time and say, God, I want to want you more. Now the problem with the Christian life is this. Our desires, uh, they easily fizzle out evaporate. Is it? Today we can be very strong in, in our desire to say, God, I really want you. Tomorrow, huh, something may happen and that desire will completely fizzle out. So you cannot depend on your feelings. You, know. you have to depend on your heart, your heart's desire, your will, huh, your determination also. Yes, I'm going to make this time to be with Jesus in my life. I don't want ham chim peng and half cup of coffee type of devotion. You see. So you have to learn to make that time. Start with, if you have not ever started, start with five minutes a day. My whole toma. Lay handphone does sang pun up chong lo. You look at handphone already half an hour. So what is five minutes with Jesus? Isn't it? And by the way, we don't want to be Sunday Christian. 
We don't want to be so shallow. Saramban Life Assembly is not, they are not Sunday Christians. Yeah, we want to destroy that, that kind of a slogan. You know. That kind of slogan cannot exist in this vicinity, you know. We don't want to be Sunday Christian. And so, so our, so the shallow roots, they don't learn to drink from the stream below. See. They depend on someone to come and water the ground. They depend on a preacher. See. They depend on a, a doctor. They depend on someone else to come and feed them and give them inspiration. Spiritual life, you see. All of us go through a phase where we need people to support us. Till now, uh, after a long time, time a Christian for all the, our life, we need people to support us continuously. You see. But our spiritual life is not dependent upon people in the church. Our spiritual life is dependent upon Jesus Christ, who not only died on the cross, but who lives inside you. So you as a plant must learn to connect with Him, relate with Him, find Him in your heart, cultivate His presence, seek Him, Make time to worship Him. Make time to look towards Him. Make time to pray. And read your Bible. Your Bible, as you read, will teach you how to pray. Find books to read. You see. Books that will, that will feed your interest and desire to know God so that you can follow Him. You see. So you have to live this way if you are going to grow uh, as a Christian, you want to be a Siddharth of Lebanon. You don't want to be a Malaysian small, tiny little plant. Uh, yako, whoo, lamsai yolo. Where, how to bear fruit like that? Isn't it? So our roots have to be deepened. That's why your daily prayer time uh, with Jesus is joy chong yu, very important. You must find the time, either morning, afternoon, evening, night, after the baby is asleep or children is asleep, you must make that time, you see. If not every day, alternate days. And then as you grow, you make it every day, you see. So you start with five minutes, then ten minutes. Don't be satisfied where you are, you see. The more you do it, the stronger that desire becomes, you see. The more you do it, the Spirit of God is confronting you. He's there to meet you. He's already present there before, before you come to pray to Him. You see. God is the initiator. He's the first mover. He's always ahead of us. He yearns for us more than we yearn for Him. You see. His yearning for us is an eternal, everlasting yearning. You see. He yearns so hard, so deep, so painfully that He sent His only Son, Jesus, to die on the cross to show us how much He really yearns for us and desires us to be His children, to, to walk closely to Him, to be changed from glory to glory uh, into His likeness and to become like Him so that He can share His glory, His presence and all that He is with us, poured inside us. You see. That's why the Bible tells us that He has prepared for us a new body after this one becomes dust, you see. So God has an everlasting master plan. Our plan, uh, even the best businessmen, we can only plan for 50 years. Very short term. One dimensional only. But no vertical dimension, you see. And so your time with Jesus will determine your flourishing, you see. your planting, your rootedness, your growth into God. So your time, if you are serving, ministering, leading, you must have this. Or else we'll be a tree eh, that got no roots. You can't imagine what that is like. Is it? 
a tree with no roots, you see. But many Christians today, they don't want to make this time. I tell you, even pastors, I've heard so many stories, don't know how to pray. When they are alone with Jesus, they don't know what to do. They take out the handphone. As if Jesus is going to text them, you know. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to be alone uh, with the Lord. Is it? We can talk about this, but some people here have to go for a wedding afterwards. Uh, so I have, to, I have to stop. So, next time we can talk about this. How to be alone with God. What do you really, really do? Is it? So if you are alone with God, <clears throat> many Christians, they are aiming for the easiest way, as I was saying. Now, they don't, those who are spiritual minimalists, they don't have time to pray. They hardly pray. The only time they pray is when they want a parking lot in the shopping mall. Or they give thanks for their food. Or there is an emergency, there is a crisis. Children sick, grandchildren sick. You know, cannot get a job, cannot get a contract, cannot sell a property, you see. So can you see uh, how shallow we are? See? We don't know how to pursue Jesus for who He is to us uh, and how great He is, as the song says, you see? that He's ever present with us. You see? He's so powerful with us. We can experience His love and His life inside us by His Spirit each day. You see? And so, many Christians don't think about pursuing Jesus and coming to God, making time for Him. So when we do so, we have to remember one very important thing. As I mentioned earlier, that our desires will fizz, fizzle out and we need to be so honest with God to tell God the truth that God, I really, really want you. I need you. I really need you to give me the desire to help me to find you. Because the human mind and heart uh, cannot find God unaided. Without God's help, you can't find Him. You can't find Him using your high IQ. Is it? If He doesn't show up, you won't know anything. Because He's so great. Is it? He's so beyond anything you can imagine or think of. He's outside of your capacity to even comprehend Him. One minute is it? That's how great He is, is it? So we need God to help us to find Him, is it? When God answers our prayer, it's not because we are spiritual. It's not because we got something inside us that, that can get God to do things. It's nothing to do with us because there's nothing good to the very pits of our hearts. Uh, there's absolutely nothing good in you uh, in the sight of God. You see. Even though we are the best father and mother to our children. You see. But in the eyes of God, in the presence of His infinite holiness, uh, you and I got nothing good inside us. So everything is dependent upon what Jesus did for us on the cross, you see. Through that event, God lavished and poured out His grace upon our lives. So we need God. Now, a lot of charismatic uh, churches, they think they, they think, they try to teach you this. They think that there is some method, there is some key, there is some technique that you can learn Certain things you can say, you can do uh, to get God to do certain things. You know. If that's the case, then you are God. Then God is subservient to you. He's transcendent. He's the Almighty. You know. Before there was even a, 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 a dust in the universe, He was already there. So what makes you think that we can manipulate Him by spiritual techniques? cannot be manipulated. You see. So if you go that path, you'll be deluded and self-deceived because you won't know God 
and who he is. He is the, the what call, Karl Barth called the holy other. He's totally other than what we ever, ever think of him. Is he? So the more we, he, he reveals himself to us, the more we realize uh, that we are even more and more totally uh, insignificant. We are nothing. Everything God does in response to our need is because of His mercy. And He's rich in mercy. He's so rich in mercy that it cannot, His mercies and grace cannot be exhausted. It cannot diminish. It is infinitely infinite. I used to, you know, feel so condemned that because, because I thought, I think God has a, got a quota of forgiveness for a person like me. La. I used to think that way. You see. Then one day the Lord spoke to me you know, that His forgiveness and His grace uh, is infinitely infinite. There is no quota. If there is a quota, He is not God. Because He will be limited by a quota system. So God is so great. You see. So we don't have time to look at the next passage already, uh, Dr. Guan. Okay, let me give you briefly. In Mark chapter 10, this uh, rich young ruler who came to Jesus and he asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus told him, well, you know the commandments. Uh, you know, thou shalt not kill, commit adultery, steal, uh, uh, deceive your neighbor, etc., etc. And he was so delighted when Jesus said that, he thought and he told Jesus, oh, I have done all those things from young. And then here came the, the killer uh, point. Jesus' reply was this. Uh, if you desire to inherit eternal life and have treasures in heaven, then go sell all that you have uh, and give to the poor. You know? The Bible tells us in Mark's Gospel that he was so sad and he went away sorrowful you know? because, and the Bible says this, uh, he had great possessions, you see. So he was a Christian, you can say, who externally uh, looked very religious, very spiritual. He kept all those commandments. But internally, uh, he was a spiritual minimalist because he just lived for the bare minimum. And his possession hindered him from further growth in God because when Jesus spoke to him the words, uh, go sell all that you have, give to the poor, he could not accept it because he loved his possessions, gave him a good life. And he enjoyed his freedom and he wanted to be in control of the way uh, he wanted to live his life. He didn't want to change. You see. He satisfied with keeping an external form of being spiritual or religious. You see. He did some good works, you see. But that's it, is it? He's not interested in more. No? Now, we may not have great possessions materially like the rich ruler, but our possession, our greatest possession is the way I want to live my life. The way I want to use my time. The way I want to use my money even though I have little. It's the way I want to live. I am the center of my own life. I am the Godhead uh, of my own life. I decide. I determine. Is it? But Jesus told this ru rich ruler, go sell all that you have, take up the cross, and follow me. Is it? Now this is a great invitation. It's a privilege. It's a golden opportunity. But he couldn't see it. Is it? Even many of us, when we read this parable, we can't see that golden opportunity that to become a disciple is far, far greater than being a rich ruler where he is right now. Nothing wrong with being rich. But for him, the call of God was, go sell all that you have and you will have treasures in heaven and become a disciple, a follower of God and you will walk closely with Jesus and Jesus will use you, teach you, guide you, and you will be a great blessing to many others. But he couldn't see it. Is he? 
Now, often when God speaks to us, uh, if He says, I'm going to bank in 100,000 into your bank account tomorrow, we will all say, Oh, hallelujah. God is good all the time. But if He says, go sell all that you have, take up the cross and follow me, we will have a lot of questions. Now, uh, are you sure? Uh, me? Uh, can you confirm? Uh, can ask Dr. Kwan to confirm? Speak to me first, Lord, second time. After the Lord speak to you second time, you want third time and fourth time. And still, more yok. Say them, yok. Mati, mati also don't want to move. But if it's 100,000 into the bank account, oh, God is good all the time. But you won't say this if Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. So our hearts are very deceitful. Mine too. You know, we are, we are all full of crap inside us. So we need Jesus. We need the blood of Jesus. We need the Holy Spirit to help us, to change us, you see. So when Jesus, so he was so attached to himself, to his own life, and he was unwilling, because he was unwilling to detach from his attachments, his good life, his independent life, his individualistic life, he was so unwilling, his unwillingness uh, blinded him, prevented him from hearing the words of Jesus, the words of God, is it? So he became, his unwillingness blocked him, made him blind, made him spiritually deaf to the words of God himself speaking to him. See? But if he had not resisted, if he had opened his heart, then the words of Jesus would have come into his heart, faith would have come inside him. And the words of Jesus would have enlightened his heart and mind uh, to see uh, that what Jesus said and what Jesus was offering him, although in the eyes of the world it's senseless, it doesn't make sense, but because the words of God enlightens the heart, he would be able to see uh, that what Jesus was offering him was far, far greater, far, far better than all the, the wealth that he had. So the Spirit of God is able to enlighten us. So when we spend time with Jesus, we not only pray, worship and sing to Him and take time to be with God and sit in His presence, cultivate that presence, but also to read His Word at least a chapter a day. And then after you have read, think about what impressed you throughout the day. Think about what impressed you throughout the day and write in a notebook. Write in a notebook what you have learned. So following Jesus, when Jesus told the rich young ruler, it means this, to follow Jesus means uh, he must now learn to follow Jesus by following what Jesus says to him. That means listening to God's word. You see. Listening to what God speaks to us through his word, or through the preaching, or through the worship, through the song, through books that you read, in whatever way, or through your interaction and fellowship, God speaks to you. So you learn to follow Him. So we give up our self-relying, independent, uh, our independent ways uh, of living our life. We are now living uh, in relation to a, a higher person, a higher purpose, a greater being, is it? So we learn to follow by listening, by worshipping, by obeying His voice. So this is what it means to follow Jesus, what it means to be planted. You see. So your roots will grow like the cedar of Lebanon. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. As you are responding to the Lord, as in whatever way that God has spoken to you, as you are responding to Him in, in your heart, I want you to just lift up your hands, put it over your chest, or lift up your hand halfway and as a response to God and say, God, I want to respond to you. I want to turn to you. I want to be a tree planted with roots 
that grow deep. I, lear- I want to learn to connect with you and to find your presence real in my own heart, Lord. And I want to learn to walk with you. I want to learn to know you. There's so much more, Lord, to learn, to grow. And I want to grow. I want to learn, Lord. I need you. Just say this in your heart. Help me, Lord Jesus. Help me. I don't know a thing. Help me, Lord. I don't know how, but help me, Jesus. Help me to know. Help me to learn. Help me to discover. Help me, Lord, to draw near to you. Turn me, as the Sami says, turn my heart towards you and I will be turned. Draw me and I will come near you, Lord, and seek your face, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Let's arise to our feet and we're going to pray. So surrender your heart to Jesus. Say, Lord, I want to surrender my heart to you more and more each day. Like a root planted by the rivers of living waters, Lord. Jesus. Father, we lift up every heart here today before you. We lift up all the questions that we have in our minds. We lift up all the vacant spots, areas in our hearts, Lord. And all the vacuous places in our souls. We ask you to help us descend upon us, Lord, by your Spirit, enlighten our hearts and help us to know your way, to find the way that you have for us. We lift up every heart here today. We ask you to take it, Lord Jesus, and help these hearts to find you, to grow in you, to be a plant, a life that is planted in the house of the Lord, that make each one and cause them to flourish, Lord, till old age, let them be bearing fruits of your glory, your likeness, Lord, your love, your compassion, your strength, your grace. In the holy name of Jesus, come and touch every heart right now. Inspire us, ignite our desires for you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. I'm going to pass the time to the worship leader. Those of you who have needs, uh, you can come forward and I'll be very glad to pray with you.